All right, so anemia. In anemia, an means no, and emia means blood. So anemia is a condition where the patient has no blood. Just kidding. It means that there's a deficiency of red blood cells or hemoglobin in the blood. Typically, this is below 13.5 grams per deciliter in males and 12 grams per deciliter in females. It's actually a really common condition. It's estimated that over 10% of people over the age of 65 are anemic, and that number rises to 20% in over 85s. Anemia isn't only seen in elderly patients though, it can be seen in patients of all ages. Because there are so many different causes of anemia, it can seem kind of overwhelming at first, but if you learn the classification, it becomes quite straightforward. There are two main ways of classifying it, by size or volume of the red blood cells, which is where the different types are divided into microcytic, normocytic and macrocytic anemia, or we can divide anemia based on the pathophysiology. So we have hyperproliferative anemia, ineffective erythropoiesis, hemolytic anemia, or hemorrhagic anemia. So let's take a look at the volume classification first. This is based on the MCV, or mean corpuscular volume, of the red blood cells, which is just the average volume of the red blood cells in a sample. Microcytic anemia is defined when the value is below 80 fentolitres. Normocytic is 80 to 100 fentolitres, and macrocytic anemia is above 100 fentolitres. We can then fit in the different types of anemia into these three categories. Under microcytic anemia, we have the most common cause of anemia worldwide, iron deficiency anemia. I go into more detail for each of these in my microcytic anemia video, but generally, iron deficiency anemia is caused by a loss of iron typically through chronic bleeding like menstruation in younger females and colon cancer or peptic ulcers in more elderly individuals. But it can also occur due to inadequate intake. For example, someone simply not eating enough beans or meat or whatever, or someone having trouble absorbing the iron like in celiac disease. Also, iron needs an acidic environment for optimal uptake. So people using proton pump inhibitors or someone who's had a gastrectomy may also end up with iron deficiency anemia. You'll see low ferritin and transferrin saturation with a high total iron binding capacity. Treatment is usually to find the underlying cause, so to prevent the bleeding and then to give the patient iron. Another microcytic anemia is sideroblastic anemia, which is where we essentially have iron overload due to some step in the production of heme being dysfunctional. For example, aminolevulinic acid dehydratase in lead poisoning, leading to an accumulation of iron in the mitochondria, which then surround the nucleus of immature red blood cells, which are known as the ringed sideroblasts. Ferritin and transferrin saturation levels will be elevated here, while TIBC is low or normal. Thalassemia is another cause of microcytic anemia. It's a disorder in the genes coding for hemoglobin. We have alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia occurs if we have problems in the four alpha genes, and the severity depends on how many of the genes are affected. While the same is true also for beta, we only have two beta genes. Finally, we also have anemia of chronic inflammation or of chronic disease, which can be either a microcytic or a normocytic anemia. Essentially what happens here is that during a chronic state of disease or inflammation, we have an increase in hepcidin, which is a marker of inflammation and a molecule involved in iron metabolism. Hepcidin basically locks away iron in macrophages and stops the absorption of iron from the gut, so our cells can't use the iron to produce hemoglobin. The reason it does this is because it's trying to prevent the iron being used by microbes to grow and proliferate. Now let's look at normocytic anemia. So the MCV here is between 80 and 100 fentolitres, like we said. Included in this category are the anemia of chronic inflammation, hemorrhagic anemia, hemolytic anemias like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, G6PD, hereditary spherocytosis, diffuse intravascular coagulopathy. Again, I'll go into details on these in the hemolytic anemia video. Cancers such as leukemia are also in this list, as well as myeloproliferative disorders, 
where initially we may even see increased red blood cell counts and hematocrit, such as in polycythemia vera, but they progress towards myelofibrosis, where we see the anemia, or even a mixture of microcytic and macrocytic anemias in the same patient can also give us normal cytic anemia. Finally, we have macrocytic anemias, where the MCV is above 100 femtoliters. These could be further divided into megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic. Megaloblastic meaning we have a problem in DNA synthesis and repair, whereas non-megaloblastic do not have DNA replication problems. Under megaloblastic, we have the ones that are more typical, like vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency is often seen due to pernicious anemia, where antibodies are produced against parietal cells in the stomach or intrinsic factor, and since B12 needs to be bound to intrinsic factor for proper absorption, you can end up with a vitamin B12 deficiency. You can also get vitamin B12 deficiency in malabsorption syndromes, like Whipple's disease or small bowel bacterial overgrowth, and since it's absorbed in the ileum, Crohn's disease can also be linked to it. Folate deficiency mostly comes from a diet deficient in fruits and vegetables, but can also be caused by celiacs or Crohn's. The important difference between the two are that it takes a long time to become deficient in B12, but folate stores can run out in a few weeks. Non-megaloblastic anemia includes chronic alcohol use, liver disease, hypothyroidism, myelodysplastic syndromes, and sometimes hemolysis and hemorrhage. Okay, now for the pathophysiology classification. In this classification, different causes of anemia are divided based on how they cause anemia. We already said that these were hypoproliferative anemia, ineffective erythropoiesis, and hemolytic or hemorrhagic anemia. Hypoproliferative anemia means that the bone marrow is not producing the red blood cells correctly, so it's a production problem. Here we find iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic disease, caused from bone marrow damage such as aplastic anemia, fibrosis, and causes from a decreased stimulation to produce more red blood cells, including renal disease, inflammation, and metabolic disorders. Ineffective erythropoiesis means that the bone marrow may be working correctly, but some external factor is limiting the production of red blood cells. So think of it more as a problem in the maturation of the red blood cells rather than the production. We can split these into cytoplasmic and nuclear issues. Cytoplasmic issues being seen in iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia and thalassemia, while in nuclear issues we have folate and vitamin B12 deficiency. Then finally we have the section for hemorrhagic and hemolytic anemia coming from metabolic defects, membrane defects, hemoglobinopathies, and immune destruction. Anemia can generally present with a combination of nonspecific signs and symptoms, such as pallor, especially places like the conjunctiva, fatigue and weakness, dyspnea, headaches, and dizziness, as well as some features that suggest a more specific anemia, like iron deficiency anemia may have pica, where patients crave chewing strange things like ice cubes. Hemolytic anemia can often have jaundice, or vitamin B12 deficiency can also cause neurological manifestations that may mimic dementia. The workup for anemia involves lab investigations, specifically looking at the complete blood count, bilirubin levels, and the reticulocyte count. Looking at these three values will allow us to categorize most cases of anemia. From the CBC, you'll be able to see the hemoglobin levels, the hematocrit, which is the volume of packed red blood cells in 100 milliliters of blood, which should be approximately 35 to 45% in females and 38 to 48% in males. These values help us to establish that anemia is in fact present and you'll be able to categorize it based on the MCV. Looking at reticulocyte levels and bilirubin levels, you can establish which one of the pathophysiological mechanisms are present. Generally, where there is an increased destruction of red blood cells, you'll see bilirubin levels increase. Normally, they are below roughly 1 mg per deciliter. Reticulocytes are immature red blood cells, 
they normally circulate in the blood for a day before maturation, so an increased number indicates that the bone marrow is working to produce more red blood cells, and so this value is a good marker for bone marrow activity. Normally, the range is between 0.5 and 2% in adults, but in anemic adults, you would expect the level to be higher if the bone marrow is working correctly. Hypoproliferative anemia usually has a low or normal bilirubin level and low reticulocytes. Ineffective erythropoiesis usually has higher bilirubin levels that occurs due to increased breakdown of hemoglobin, but low reticulocytes. In cases of hemorrhage, you would expect to see normal bilirubin and high reticulocytes, compared to hemolytic anemia, where you would expect to see high bilirubin and high reticulocytes, again because of the increased destruction of red blood cells. Usually, the treatment and management involves finding out what the underlying cause is and correcting it, as well as supporting the patient in the meantime. You may transfuse patients when their haemoglobin levels become really low, usually below 7 to 8 grams per deciliter. In iron deficiency anemia, you'd need to find out why this occurred, so in someone over 65, you may elect for a colonoscopy looking for colorectal cancer or endoscopy looking for peptic ulcers. You could also look at the nutrition status of the patient by evaluating their weight and albumin levels, then arranging support for a better intake. Iron can be given as an oral tablet, which is associated with GI side effects, and so often patients don't stick to taking them. Alternatively, iron can be given as an injection. In vitamin B12 deficiency, perhaps the patient has pernicious anemia, and so intramuscular injections of vitamin B12 can be given. 